Abraham, bro. Abraham. <laughs> So I, I want to start off with, uh, you know, God is speaking to the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. Uh, chapter 41, verse 8, God says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendants of Abraham, my friend, uh, I took hold of you from the ends of the earth and called you from the uh, outermost parts and said to you, You are my servants. I have chosen you, not rejected you. Uh, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. You know, I, I love the fact that God makes a reference to his covenant relationship with Abraham as we get to this prophet Isaiah, but he calls him his friend. And now we see the beginning of that friendship. I would say the linchpin of uh, the book of Genesis, chapter number 12, it takes this turn, this bend into one individual where now God is going to actually intervene even more and, and pull something out of humanity and establish people to himself. And he starts out with Abraham. Lech Lecha. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha <laughs> in the Hebrew. Get that um, clock going. <laughs> what does that mean? Such a good question. Okay. Literally, it just means go. Mm. God says to Abraham, go. Mm -hmm. uh, what it literally means, like literally, literally. So Lech is a command. Mm-hmm means go. Mm -hmm. Lecha means for you. Mm -hmm. So what God is saying is go for yourself. Now, it's a it's an expression. It means go. But one of the classic Jewish commentators from the medieval period, Rashi, it's like one of the great commentators, he says, lech lecha, la'atzmecha. When God says go for you, he means go for your benefit. God's saying, I'm telling you to leave behind everything, your family, your homeland, mm -hmm. your culture, everything you know. And I'm asking you to trust me. To go to something you don't know. To go somewhere you have never seen before. Mm -hmm. Just know that it's for your benefit. Mm. Actually, parenthetically, so in Israel right now, like one of the coolest things happening in culture is the rise of like some of the most popular artists in the country, like literally like the number one, two, three, four singers in the country are actually weaving these ancient traditions into these like popular songs. And one of my favorite songs, there's an artist named Akiva and one of his best songs is called literally Lech Lecha. Um, and the chorus is Lech Lecha Latzmecha. Go for yourself. Mm. God's saying, I'm asking you to take a leap of faith. Just know that I'm holding your hand as you leap. It's for you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, this word lech lecha comes into play as, you know, we zone in on one individual. Yeah. And we can get caught up in the idea of when we follow God, when we obey God, when we're pursuing God in a righteous, faithful way, we're doing him a favor. Like, I'm doing something for God now. Right. I'm giving up this God <laughs> and I'm, I'm following you and I'm sharing your word and I'm trying to reflect who you are to the world through my life, my actions, I'm, I'm helping you, God. And I think what's powerful about Lech Lecha is, no, I'm not. God doesn't need me. Uh, I'm not doing God a favor by being faithful to him. In fact, if anything, I'm doing a favor to myself by being faithful to who he is because that is where my best interests are. My best interest is in relation with God. And so the beginning of this, like, like you say, God gives Abraham a commandment to leave somewhere, to leave his, his family, his household, the land that he's in. But ultimately it's for Abraham's benefit, not God's. And so I guess a byproduct of following God is that you are given this blessing that God wants to give you, but it's for my benefit. Um, and in the same way, when I run from sin and I run from things that are not for, good for me, it's also for my benefit. It's not just, oh, see, God, I'm trying to make you happy. The beginning of this story is interesting because we, we look at Abraham and we consider him the father of faith. Yep. Right? And I think this is the first part of the Torah where we really, really go into the details of someone's life. Up until this point where exactly. we're seeing glimpses. This is the beginning of history, mm. right? Yeah. And we're seeing these we see glimpses of Adam. We see glimpses of, of, of Noah. And, and now we're going to get some real detail 
about what it looks like uh, to be obedient, um, the highs and the lows of that, and also I think it's sums up the journey of the human experience. The first thing I notice about this that some people might miss is- Get into it, baby. Yeah, we're going, we're going straight in. Oh, my God. We're diving in. <laughs> yeah, we've been like licking our chops for this episode. <laughs> this is one of, by far one of my favorite Sorry, chapters. Adam and Eve, Noah, whatever, tell about Abraham. Yeah, Abraham. Abraham. <laughs> Abraham, because it feels so much more tangible, doesn't yeah. it? Um, you come to the land, you come to Israel, there is a place that, you know, we could take you uh, called Hebron, and there's a place called the Tomb of the Patriarchs where tradition- is that this is the very place where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, Sarah, um, Leah, and Rebecca. Rebecca are buried. There, in this place, you can go to their tomb today. And so all of a sudden, from what seemed to be like Adam and Noah, and we don't know, and sometimes people try and create legend, now we're talking about a figure where we can say, well, this is where he's buried. Yep. So we're starting to kind of begin to grasp the Bible a little bit more. First thing that stands out to me is this. God says, leave, um, he says, um, get going from your land, from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. My heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, um, to bless you, to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. So off the back of these people trying to make a great name for themselves in the Tower of Babel, God's saying, no, 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 you're not going to have a great name. I'm going to give Abraham a great name, but it's going to be my desire to give you a great name. Now, he gives him three things to leave. Leave the land, leave his relative, leave his father's house. Does Abraham successfully tick all those boxes? Ooh, it's so funny. That's what I want to talk about also, right? Because weirdly, like if you look back just a few verses, mm -hmm. right? So Tara, Abraham's father, actually was already journeying towards Canaan. He doesn't get there. Yes, he stops. Mm -hmm. right? They're born in Mesopotamia in the city of Ur, which is, you could see the city of Ur today, like yeah. the ruins of Ur. Modern they, day Iraq. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they're, travel they're traveling from, from Iraq to like halfway, basically somewhere in Syria, mm -hmm. right? And that's where they stop. And it's like one of those great kind of like uncompleted journeys. You kind of wonder what would have happened had Tara gone all the way. Mm. But it's that like at that midpoint, where Terah has kind, of, has kind of like given up on this great journey, stops halfway, that God says to Abraham, I need you to complete the journey. Mm. And the question is, does he leave his family behind? What do you like? Well, I actually want to get into this. Like, mm. what, what's your perspective on that? Well, my perspective is this. We have, we often look at Abraham as we call him the father of faith. Yeah. Right. But Abraham was also a son. Correct. Oh, I'm so glad we're getting into yeah. this. Yeah. And so... You know, the father started something mm -hmm. and yet it'll be the son, Abraham, who will complete that. Um, and he won't complete it in the most perfect of ways to begin with. And, and Abraham's journey is one where I think we'll often ask the question, is Abraham getting this or is he completely right. off? Like in the first example I would give is, you know, he's, he's called to leave his relatives and then the very next thing it says that Lot came with him. And Lot would be his nephew. Right. right. So it's, uh, I don't know if you're listening to instructions here, Abraham, but, but <laughs> Lot would be considered a relative. And so we see that there's a lack of attention to detail in the beginning of Abraham's story. He got, he got the word and he's obedient to that word, but the attention to detail from the very beginning of the story seems to be lacking. And we see this instantly because Lot comes with him and then immediately after that, we see that there's issue between Lot's herdsmen mm -hmm. and Abraham's herdsmen. There's co there's conflict already. And immediately when they enter into the land, they have to separate from each other. Yep. And so what we find is that that issue of not listening to the details of God sometimes can cause massive ramifications later on. Why do I mean this? If we track Lot's story as we'll go through this. Lot has two, two daughters. His daughters will... Uh, sleep with their own father in a bizarre way, thinking that all of humanity may have been destroyed and they have to continue on, the population on. They get their father drunk, they have two children. And the two children that will be birthed from Lot's line will be the two enemies of Israel when they start making their way back into the land. Remember what we talked about in one of That's the early episodes? Point. The consequences of sin. Yes. Yeah will not necessarily present themselves immediately, but they will rear their head 
to possibly a different generation. So Abraham's little choice, small, insignificant, well, I'm just, you know, yes, I'm going to leave. God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to do what you commanded you to do. I'm going to trust you. But Lot's coming with me. How bad could it be? And it wasn't so bad until they got into the land and then they had to separate. And then Lot's life would be heavily changed with his time in Sodom, which we'll talk about. But it's the children that are born from Lot, from all the series of circumstances that unfold, that will now cause Israel a greater issue when they enter into the land. And I think, by the way, we need to talk about this now, Mm. right? What's the biggest question I'm sure both of us get on this kind of thing, and and you especially? Mm. Why does God need a land, right? Mm. Why does God need to choose a land? Why just not, why why tell Abraham to go anywhere in particular? Just Mm. worship me wherever you find me, Mm. right? So... The key to that is the very first words that a- that God speaks to Abraham is, as you said, lech lecha, go, me mm-hmm. artzacha, from your land, from your father's, you know, from your birthplace, from your family. Where are you supposed to go? El ha'aretz asher ar eka. By mm-hmm. the way, that, that means to the land that I will show you. Mm-hmm. This is the first verse that any school child that's studying biblical Hebrew, this is always the first verse that you learn, this one right here. So God says, go do the aretz. That's the word that we translate as land. Now, where have we seen that word aretz before, that word land before in the Bible? So actually, we have seen it already earlier in the Bible many, many times. It just doesn't mean land. It means earth. So when God creates the heavens and the earth, it's mm. God creates the heavens, Hashemayim, and the earth, the Haaretz. It's the same word. Um, so you start to think, okay, wait a minute. I've seen that word before in the story of creation. Are there other parallels between this story and the story of creation? All of a sudden you start to see dozens of them. For mm. example, after God creates the heavens and the earth, what's the first thing that God that God does for humans? blesses them. Mm -hmm. And that verb is bara, is barech, right? To bless. What's the first thing God says to, God says to Abram after he sends him to the land? Mm -hmm. He says, you'll be a blessing. And then God, and I will bless those who bless you, Mm -hmm. right? What's the substance of the blessing? Well, think back to Genesis. What's the blessing? God says, be fruitful, multiply, so children, and fill up the earth. So land, right? The blessing of children and the blessing of land. What's the first ble- what is the first blessing that God gives to Abraham? If you look in the beginning of chapter 12 here, God says, I'm going to make your children many mm-hmm. and I'm going to give them this land, right? Mm. So we see the creation narrative being replayed again and again and again. And what does that mean? Well, okay, let's think about who's the character of if 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 the beginning of Genesis 12 is just a recreation of the creation narrative, which, by the way, in our last episode, we showed how Noah's story is the recreation of, of the creation story in Genesis. Mm-hmm. Right. So if Abraham is repeating the creation story again, what's different here, right? So we saw that there's a parallel. But who is Abraham in the story? So, well, you might say, well, Abraham is the human. Abraham is basically just Adam and Eve, right? God's creating the land of Israel, quote unquote, just like he created the earth. Except it's not so simple because so, that's true for all the parallels you said just now. But there's some ways in which Abraham actually plays a different role. For example, you mentioned Lot, mm-hmm. right? So if you look in Genesis 13, verse 9, mm-hmm. so Abraham says to Lot, uh, you know, the, the, basically in the previous verse, he says, you know, there's, there's, we shouldn't be fighting with each other. We should separate. So Abraham says, look, behold, the whole land is before you. And I'm curious, what, what, how, how does, how, what's your English translation of verse 9? Verse 9 says, isn't the whole land before you? Please separate yourself from me. If to the left, then I'll go to the right. And if to the right, then I'll go to the left. Right. So those words separate from me, that actually is how you have to translate it in English, but it's not what it says in Hebrew. Hmm. In the Hebrew, it says, he paridna me alai. That doesn't mean, hipared na means separate now, right? But me alai doesn't mean from me. It means from on top of me. That's literally what it means, from on top of me. Mm. Nowhere in the Bible, anytime those, that word separate is used, uh, it means everywhere else in the Bible, it says separate from me. This is the only place in the Bible where it says separate from on top of me. What the heck does that mean? So the answer is we actually have seen something being separated from on top of something else earlier in the Bible. 
Mm. It's the second day of creation. Mm -hmm. God separates the lower waters from on top. Me'al, it's the same exact word from on top of the of the upper waters from on top of the lower waters. It's literally the same exact word. Mm. So Abraham here is actually playing the role of God, right? He's separating himself from on top of Lot, just like God separates the, the upper waters from on top of the lower waters. Mm -hmm. The very next thing that that happens is the Bible actually compares uh compares the uh uh oh here in in verse 10, right? Lot looks up looks up and he sees the whole plain before him. Mm -hmm. And this is before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he sees it's like the garden of God, right? We're explicitly comparing the land that Abraham sends Lot to, to the garden of Eden, mm -hmm. right? So just like God places human, the first humans in the garden of Eden, Abraham places Lot in the garden of God in, in, in the land of Israel. So on the one hand, you have this tension between Abraham playing the role of human and Abraham playing the role of God. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Because what's happening here, God is saying, look, until now, and this is the theme of like the last couple episodes, right? Mm -hmm. Until now, I've been the parent, human beings have been the infant. Mm -hmm. And I started by saying, you know what? I started by saying to Adam and Eve, I'm gonna give you control over the whole world. What's the first thing they do? They sin, Adam and Eve sin, Cain kills Abel. So, and and then the world is full of Hamas, right? So humanity can't handle control over the entire world. That's mm -hmm. impossible. And then God destroys the world and tries again. And what happens? God gives humanity now a little more direction, says you're still in charge of the world, but I'm gonna give you like a couple of simple rules. Don't kill, mm -hmm. don't eat blood, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? And, the, and what happens? Well, Noah's children also, there's sin, there's the Tower of Babel, humanity starts to descend again. So finally God says, when he gets to Abraham, he says, okay, you know what? We're not gonna have all human beings being charged of the entire world. That's just too much responsibility. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a single family and I'm gonna give them responsibility over a single piece of land. And they're gonna be the representatives of God in that land, just like, that's why the word aretz is used here. There are other words for land in the Bible and there are other words for earth in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The reason the Bible uses the word aretz to describe both the whole earth in Genesis one and the land of Israel in Genesis 12 is because what God is saying is, I'm gonna set you, Abraham, up as both my servant in the land, and you're also gonna have to play the role of God because you're created in my image. What I want you to do is I'm not putting you in charge of the whole earth. In fact, Israel's not allowed to conquer anything outside the land of Israel. It's actually prohibited mm -hmm. for the Israelites to conquer anything outside the land of Israel. It's not an empire. It's not like Assyria, Babylon. It's not like it's not like the, the Islamic empire or anything like that. Yeah, this, expansion is not the goal. Yeah. What I want you to do is create a lab unto the nations, mm. right? Not just the light, a lab unto the nations in this land. And I want you to basically treat this like I treat all of creation. God says, I rule over the entire world and I want you to try and mimic me mm. in this land. Create a just society, create a godly society, create a society that can serve as a beacon of light. That's why God assigns responsibility to Abraham and his descendants to this land, because it's the place where they're gonna live out the destiny that God has given them. And that's why God promises to return them, mm. because ultimately this is the, the the task that he's given to Abraham is the task of responsibility. So it's, it's almost as if as God zooms in on one man, he's also zooming in on one land. Land, exactly. And so it all comes into this kind of pinpoint fixture of now, if you want to understand who I am as the divine creator and the one who desires relationship with you, it's all going to be centralized now, uh, beginning with this man and staying in this land. And that's going to echo out into the f farther, further reaches and the four corners of the earth. And that's why God says in Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you mm. and those who curse you will be cursed. Why? Because God's saying, listen, I'm conducting an experiment here. I'm assigning Abraham a responsibility. Your, your job, if you see him carrying out my task, is to help and to support and to respect that this is his job. If you can do that, then that means you'll understand what my task is for you too, mm -hmm. right? God wants humanity to flourish everywhere in the world. And God wants us to use our zones of responsibility to bring his light and his word into the world. So God's saying, listen, I'm 
I'm asking, I'm assigning Abraham a job. Doesn't mean he's better than anybody. He's certainly not. We, I mean, like God doesn't give a reason for choosing Abraham in Genesis 12. That's the ultimate mystery. There's no, God doesn't tell us why he chooses Abraham. Nowhere in the Bible, anywhere in the Bible, does God ever say, here's why I chose Abraham and Sarah. Literally never. Mm. We don't know because it's not about superiority. It's just about, hey, here's your job. God says, if you're gonna do a job, I need to protect you. So those who bless you will be blessed. And those who curse you are interfering in my plan. Mm. And so they'll be cursed. Yeah, and that's a that's a a powerful thought that God has chosen Abraham to reveal the continuation of, of his story, which is the greatest story of humanity. But yes. now it's zoned in on Abraham, and then there's an attachment condition now to all those who are not Abraham right. or part of that, which is you either you choose yep. blessing or curse. Yes. And that's a statement that we'll hear later on, but addressed to the entire nation of Israel when Moses is pleading with the people of Israel before they enter into the land. He says, I present to you before you, you know, life or death, blessing or curse. I'm telling you, and again, if we think about how God has presented himself, he always, you know, we go back to the very beginning of Adam and Eve and he says, here's the, here's the situation. That's the tree. Don't touch the tree. This is the consequence. And again, God is making a declaration, not just to Abraham, but to anyone who's going to engage with or without Abraham is that here's the, here's the scenario. There's Abraham. <laughs> it's a blessing or a curse. Yeah. You bless him, I'll bless you. You curse him, I'll curse you. And I think for a, for a large part, we can actually even see that blessing unfold through the idea of Judeo-Christian values. You know, if, if Abraham is the father of Judaism and what flows out of, you know, this uh, Abrahamic covenant is what ultimately will be the principles that God presents through the law, those who have accepted those principles, which has become the Western civilization, has flourished in such a big way. You know, uh, I would say America is the nation that, you know, under the value system of Judaism, um, which is the only real nation that was established with a, you know, originally with a, a theocratic understanding. God is the going to be the foundation of our, our nation. Israel is one. America is another. And those nations, whether you like it or not, have been blessed in our modern history. Um, and so that Abrahamic blessing can be seen so powerfully in just people's relationships with not only Abraham in his story, but also as we go on, people relating to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, I'll bless those who bless you. And, and this is a, it's not, it's not like this, this promise from God has a time limit. It seems perpetual, you know? I'm so curious about this. Do you remember the first time that you read the Bible and were just like, and just recognize that this is here, like mm. that, that, that appreciation that God has for Israel or that relationship that God has for Israel. Like, I feel like it's, I feel like so many people read through the Bible mm. and just kind of don't clock that Israel's a part of the story. I think it's know? people who don't take those, the word seriously. Yeah. You know, if I, if I have to take God's word seriously, I, I have to look at statements like that and ponder what that means. And, and like all people who have come before me all the way to Adam, I ask the question, do I take what you say seriously or not? Yeah. Yeah. And if I do, then I put it to the test. And I guess the test is the the outcome of my life based on the actions that I choose to make. I mean, at the end of the day, what this verse is presenting is there's going to be a consequence to your choices. You choose. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to bless those who bless you or curse those who curse you. Try luck. <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, there's something incredible to be said about the reestablishment of Israel, the nations that rose up against Israel uh, immediately in the in, you know in their inception in 1948. You look around at Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, you know Syria. These are not countries that are flourishing right now. Whether you put it down to politics or you know religious violence with groups and clans or whatever. The fact is that every other nation around Israel that has waged war on them uh, in our modern history aren't looking so great as nations. Um, and so you ask the question, 
is this going back to Genesis 12? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It's not complicated. In no, a sense, right? it's not complicated at all. You know, as, as we track on, we we see God call Abraham into what? Again, it's a word given and a choice to trust that word and to be obedient through action. And so I think that's what's really important about Abraham being the father of faith. <clears throat> he didn't just hear God speak and he didn't just believe God to the point of going, okay, he he took action to prove his belief. And I think that's kind of like the step that a lot of people struggle to take. A lot of people can read God's word and go, oh, you know, oh, I believe in God, right? Mm -hmm. But do I believe him enough to take action in my life? Because that's the difference. And Abraham shows the difference between someone saying, oh, well, I believe, and also I believe enough to, to go and to do what he says. And that's the difference between one person and another. But what about Lot, right? Because Lot just kind of seems, Lot just seems like one of those characters in in the life cycle of faith that just is sort of like around for when things are convenient and as soon as things get tough, just bounces. I, I think Lot is the picture of someone who goes with the flow but has no real purpose or direction and yeah. ends up in a mess. Lots of follower. Yeah. The ultimate follower. And, and you know, so often in the biblical narrative, we're presented with two figures. Right. And we look at Abraham and we look at Lot and we ask the question, well, what's really different between Abraham and Lot? You know, and I would, I would say relationship with God. Chapter 13, you know, is what I really want to touch on because I think this is like something that will challenge a lot of people in 2024. You know, um, so after Lot has separated from from Abraham, it's not until then where where God says to Abraham, "Lift up your eyes. Now look from the place where you are to the north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. For all the land that you are looking at, I will give to you and to your seed forever." First of all, it wasn't until Lot left that God made this promise. Right. So we get this general idea of I'm going to give you something in 12, but that doesn't get hashed out until Abraham actually makes the choice to separate himself from Lot. So Lot's, Lot and Abraham, Lot sees, oh, sorry, Abraham sees the issue that whatever's going on between him and Lot is not a good thing. And so he separates. And then God comes in with another promise. Everything you can see is going to be yours and your descendants forever. Now, People who claim to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which I would say is Jews and Christians, you have a problem because what does forever mean to you? If forever means to you, which is the general definition, eternal, never ending, doesn't stop, doesn't matter the circumstances, this is the land that will be the, the descendants of Abraham forever, then you have one simple choice in 2024. I support the nation of Israel, regardless of what the world is saying, because the nation of Israel, which is Jewish, the only Jewish state in the Middle East, according to God, belongs to the Jewish people forever. End of statement. I can't be I can't be against the Jewish presence in the land if I'm going to be for the Jewish God of the Bible. Here's the thing, because it sounds so straightforward when you read it, mm -hmm. right? It does. And yet, when you talk about this to to you know followers of yours, friends of yours, mm. do people see this as like so intuitive? No. Because Why is that? Because again, I think people pick and choose what they want to take from the Bible and it goes back to the floor of man. What is it in it for me? Mm -hmm. Now, as a non-Jew, what's in it for me? Right. What do I gain from the fact that God has made a promise to a very specific group of people that they're going to have a very physical inheritance, which is land? Nothing at a right. certain point. Um, so I'm not really buying into God's story, which means my relationship so with like, God. So it's like, what does Cain get from God choosing Abel? Yes, able? exactly. And yeah. so we see the, the brokenness of the human pattern presenting itself in our own lives, going, oh, well, if it's, the land's theirs and I'm not in that, so what, what's the point? Why do I care? Yep. You know? Um, and so that's when you realize that people have made the story about them and not the story about God. Because when you, once you realize what God is doing and his story comes through the Jewish people, you have no choice but to either partake or stand against. 
You know, you can either be in support or in opposition. And so that verse should be the, the and, and the other thing I would mention is for all Christians, we consider the word of God as something that is valuable in teaching for reproof and understanding and leading us. If I read that verse and I'm, I'm only in chapter 13 of the Bible, I already know where I should stand with Israel. The moment Israel has been reestablished, it is God's divine purposes. I'm all for Israel. Now, does that mean I have to agree with everything every Jewish person is doing? No, but it does mean that Jews I, don't even do that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it does mean that I have to believe that God's plan for the Jewish people is in this land, and who is whoever is opposed to it, and whoever is standing against it and using rhetoric to fight that very idea is opposed to the very God that I believe in, and I will not support them for a second. Because then all of a sudden, I'm moving myself back into chapter 12, verse 3, yep. that I'm going to be standing before the very curse that God threatened anyone who would stand against Abraham with. Um, so that's, I would say that's one of the most powerful verses for a Christian to establish where I stand in this current conflict. Now, the water is muddy. There is so much confusion as to what has unfolded in the last 76 years of Israel. But isn't that just what the, the enemy, the devil, the serpent, whatever you want to call him, does from the beginning? He comes in. There's a truth that's there. It's written. It's it's obvious. It's, it's not uh, obscure. It's very, very clear. And all of a sudden someone comes in and says, but did God really say that? Mm -hmm. Did he really mean forever? Did he really mean that those people are the descendants of Abraham and they get the land whenever he chooses? Yes, but he's trying to distort that. And so people who are being seduced into believing anything that's um, opposing to the fact that the Jewish people are back in the land and this land is theirs is now being deceived by a greater force that has been trying to deceive man from the truth of God since the beginning. Listen, it's it's it kind of goes back to what we talked about when we spoke about the serpent, mm -hmm. right? Which is the snake's perspective is to look at man and say, well, humanity can either be godly mm -hmm. in God's image or just another animal made from dirt, right? And the snake's temptation is to get us to think we're just dirt, we're just animals. And when we think that about ourselves, we behave like just animals. The same temptation occurs in the case of the land, right? The land of Israel. You can either look at it as the land that God chooses to run his experiment with Abraham in and to, to actually show the world a model for how each society can become the most virtuous version of itself. Mm -hmm. Or you can look at it as just another patch of dirt. And the temptation of the serpent is to get us to think that not just about people, but about the land, mm -hmm. it's just another patch of dirt. Mm. It's not fundamentally different than Atlanta, Georgia, than New Zealand, than Japan, than South Africa. Right? It's just, it's fundamentally just all dirt, mm -hmm. right? That's the mistake. That's the mistake. Mm. The mistake is we have to understand that each land has a story, each land has a purpose, and this land has the purpose of being the place where Abraham and Sarah and their descendants are to create that grand experiment. Mm. And once you believe that, like, you know, it's one thing I remember a friend of mine said to me is um, uh, a friend of mine, like in the kind of going through his faith journey was like, it's so weird because he had just come to Israel for the first time, right? Not a Jewish guy, just come to Israel for the first time. And he had said, you know, it's so weird. I always really said to myself, and I still believe it, you know, you can find God anywhere. And I believe that. And yet I came to the land of Israel and I felt God's presence so strongly here. How do I reckon, how do I reconcile those two things? Mm. And I said, think about what you just said to me. I feel God, God cares about people wherever they are. God cares about who I am, my, just my specific story. It's like, yeah, that's what we believe. But do you realize that belief is revolutionary in the history of human thought? Every single other tradition did not assume that. Actually, God did not care about individual people. The great gods of Babylon cared about the kings, human kings, and that was it. Mm. Think about the God of the philosophers, right? Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. What did they believe about God? God doesn't care about individual humans. God sets the laws of physics and nature and lets those things go and kind of just doesn't get involved and just pieces out, right? 
What was the first tradition that introduced to humanity the idea that God actually cares about individuals? It's the Bible, mm -hmm. because the Bible doesn't just tell the story of all of humanity, Adam and Eve and Noah and everybody who represents all of humanity. Like you said, God tells the story about an individual person and mm -hmm. family, Abraham, Sarah, and says, I care about their story and their home and their country. So what's the proof that God cares about you living in Arkansas, you living in LA, you living in London, in Paris, in, in wherever you live, right? What's the proof that God cares about you and your individual circumstances and your individual land? God shows you that he does that by first caring about Abraham and his descendants in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. If I care about them and their land, then I care about you and your land. But you only know that like your land and your story only matters if that first land matters first. So either you believe, like if you want to say God cares about me wherever I am, then by definition, you have to accept the premise that God cares about Abraham and his descendants in the land of Israel. Because otherwise the idea that God cares about you and wherever you live, no, no other religious tradition ever accepted that. Mm. It's only the biblical tradition. Mm. So the whole idea of God caring about our, our individual stories proceeds from God caring about the land of Israel. Mm. So if you want to believe that God cares about you where you are, you have to believe that God cares spe especially about the land of Israel because that's how you know that God cares about specific stories. Mm. So to me, th the whole, like you said, the whole Western, the whole Judeo-Christian idea that our God is a loving God who cares about history and intervenes in our lives and speaks to us and guides us and loves us, all of that proceeds from the premise that God cares about Abraham and his descendants in the land of Israel. Mm. That's it. Yeah. You know, and, and it, up until this point, Ari, we, we, we've seen man wrestling with God's desire for us. And so this is something that is now tangible. God has given a, a tangible place to a tangible people to show how humanity consistently and constantly wants to fight what God wants to do. Mm. Any other people group is in this land today, I would bet no one cares. <laughs> right, yeah. Any other people group, because it doesn't matter if another people group's in this land. But when the Jewish people are in this land, it confirms one thing, that God makes a promise and he keeps a promise. And that's a big problem for a humanity which is much like the humanity from the Tower of Babel. They wanted to make a great name for themselves mm -hmm. and not glorify the great name that sits above us all, which is God. And so an attack on God's promises is a fundamental reaction from a broken, rebellious humanity. Why is it important for Christians to cling to and celebrate what God has done with reestablishing the nation of Israel. Because here is a promise, a promise that you could not measure for 2,000 years. Exactly. You just have to believe it would happen kind of like by magic. Right? By magic. Yeah. But when you see the reality of Israel coming together, what it should have done to all Christian believers all, all over the world, Jews and Christians alike, is to be in agreement that God keeps his promises. Mm. Why is that important? Why is it important that I celebrate that God kept his promise to Abraham and his descendants? Because we're on, you know, page 20 right. <laughs> of the Bible. There is a lot more of this story to come. And God has made a lot more promises about redeeming a broken humanity, which I need to believe in. Death. I need to know that my God has a solution to my ultimate problem, which is my end. And so if I can see him practically making a promise and keeping a promise that I can see today, that gives me so much more confidence in every single promise that I'm still waiting to come, uh, Mashiach included. The fulfillment of this promise is the birth of hope. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, and all nations will be blessed from this. Mm -hmm. We should all look at Israel as a blessing because it means that our God reigns. You know, so much of what hap what's happening in Israel right now is a battle of gods. Mm. 
And we don't like to think of it like that because we put things on Fox News or CBN or CNN and we try and humanize and just go, okay, well, this is just a, a, a battle for land. This is just a battle of ethnicities or groups or clans or nations. No, 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 no. This is a spiritual battle of one group claiming, no, the land is ours. Another group saying, no, where we've been in this land, this land has been promised to us by our God, and we've reestablished this nation in a, a, a righteous way of integrity, and now we're being attacked. And so it's a battle of two gods, but which God is stronger? Mm. You know, and often, you know, the world likes to be politically correct and say, well, the Islamic God and the Jewish God, it's, we all believe in the same God. Right. Well, here's a problem. One God says one thing and another God says another thing. You can't have the same God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said, this is the land of the Jewish people. And if you don't agree with that, I'm sorry, you are believing and worshiping a different deity that is not the God that I believe in. Mm. Because if you did, we'd all be in agreement at least on that point right now. Right. And we can disagree on, you know, pork or no pork or, you know, uh, you know, day of fasting or not day of fasting. But if we don't agree on this fundamental point, which is uh, Abraham's story with God, then we don't believe in the same God. And so this is where there's going to be a division of people. And what we see in the biblical text is God has no problem dividing people. He has no problem with letting people go one way and another group of people going another way. He does not interfere with our free will. But the question is, what am I going to choose? Am I going to choose his words or am I going to rebel against his words, even though it's as clear as day? This land will be the descendants of Abraham forever. Chapter 14. I mean, <laughs> this is like, this is so jam-packed. Mm. It's crazy, brother. Like, it's unbelievable. We move along and, and, and we start to see the continuation of the issues of Lot. Lot gets kidnapped. Yep. Abraham has to come to the rescue. What I want to zone in now is this strange interaction that Abraham will have with Melchizedek. Yeah. Right? One of the most mysterious characters in the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. Uh, Abraham's on his way back. He's rescued Lot. He, he goes through or past Salem, which is modern-day Jerusalem, and he's confronted by this figure called Melchizedek, who's king of Salem. Uh, he brings out bread and wine, um, but he's also a, considered a priest. And it says in the scriptures, a priest of um, El, Elo, Elo, Elion. Elion, El Elion, which means the priest of the Most High, correct? Of the Most High God. The Most High God. Yeah. Um, what is this interaction? Who is this figure? How do, how do, what does yeah. Jewish tradition say? I know that one theory is that it's Shem. Yeah. Shem's so. relocated to <laughs> Jerusalem. Exactly. So, so ancient Jewish tradition does like it's in, as we kind of get further into the biblical text, we'll have, we'll have so many cool examples of how it works because mm -hmm. ancient Jewish tradition relies on like really close readings of texts. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the principles that you'll find in it is like ancient Jewish tradition. And by the way, ancient Christian tradition as well from like the first century and onwards, because it's Jewish, um, ultimately doesn't like mysterious characters to remain fully mysterious because it wants to kind of connect them to somebody else to show you what you're supposed to think about that character. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, that, that Melchizedek is Shem, that's an ancient idea that appears in the tradition. So what are we supposed to learn from that? Like, is it plausible, first of all? Like Shem would be, based on his yeah. lifespan, he's still alive. Yeah, it's potentially plausible, right. right? Like, why not just call him Shem then? Like, meaning, is, is Melchizedek literally Shem? Maybe, maybe not. Mm. But let's even take let's even take the tradition at face value. What are we supposed to learn from the idea that Melchizedek is Shem, right? It seems to me that what happens is Shem is kind of this righteous figure mm -hmm. who worships God mm -hmm. and who maintains that pure, pristine faith from the days of Noah. And yet he doesn't, he isn't able to spread it to others, right? He kind of just keeps hold of it and he's not able to inspire others with it. Now, Abraham is this figure who 
hears the word of God and he makes this journey to a new land, a mysterious land. But what he does is he kind of, he shows people what his values are. You know, he's, he's, he's actually going out and spreading the values with which he's been entrusted by God. Mm. And so then you have this kind of, and, and the ultimate example of this is, is in chapter 14, Lot is kidnapped and Abraham is called upon to rescue him from these, you know, from these cohort of kings. Yeah. yeah. These, these like chieftains. Right. And so Abraham actually puts his values into action. He says, somebody's in trouble. I'm going to save him. Right. Shem could have done it. Right. But Abraham's the one who stands up and says, I'm a man of action. Mm. Just like Noah, you know, Noah gets God's command, but ultimately doesn't try to save anybody else. Just gets on a boat. Right. Mm. Melchiz- if Melchizedek is Shem, he grew up in Noah's house. He, what he learned is when God gives you command, you worship him, but you don't necessarily go out and try to mm-hmm. help others. Mm-hmm. Now, Abraham has just demonstrated the opposite. Actually, I'm going to help other people. I'm going to put my values into action. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take those lessons that I learned from God, and I'm going to put them into action in life around me. And at the end of that battle, after Abraham has shown that you actually can change the world with your faith, that's when Shem confronts him. And he confronts Shem. And they have this meeting of two men of God. Mm. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Because it's Melchizedek's, because if Melchizedek is Shem, it's Shem's way of saying, I understand that the baton has been passed. Mm -hmm. Like this is a new era. This is an era where faith has to mean something in the world. Mm. And so that's the blessing that Melchizedek gives Shem. That, 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 That Melchizedek gives Abraham. That's the blessing. And in return, Abraham gives him a, uh, oh no, he gives a tenth of, what does he give a tenth of everything to? To um, then he gave him a tenth of everything. Um, so he gives everything, everything that Abraham collected from you know from the spoils of this this conquest to rescue Lot. He gives to Melchizedek as a, as an as an offering. He gives him a tenth exactly. Mm. And then straight away. The yeah, kings of the world come 20. and say, give me something. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, was <laughs> I saw you giving stuff away. But what's interesting, like there, there is another way to read it, by the way. Mm. Another way to read it. Nate and I were at a hummus place the other day, and we were talking about Melchizedek, as one does when mm-hmm. you get hummus. So another way to read it is Melchizedek could just be a priest of the god named El Elyon. We know who that is from mm. the ancient world and from the world of archaeology. That was like the chief Canaanite god, right? Now, those words like aren't a proper name. El Elyon just means most high god, mm-hmm. right? But that becomes kind of the title for the Canaanite, for the Canaanite god, right? And Melchizedek could just be a regular Canaanite priest, which is exactly what you would expect to find in the ancient land of Israel, the ancient land of Canaan, right? Mm. Um and so after this war is over, so the gods of the Canaanites, right, like the priests of the of these false Canaanite gods, come out and try to take credit for it, right? So Melchizedek, as an idolatrous priest in that respect, is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and say, you know, Abraham, that it was it was my God who gave you this victory. And how does Abraham respond, right? So what does Melchizedek say to Abraham in verse 19? It says, and he blessed him. And he said, right, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And he said, blessed be Abraham to El Elyon, the creator of the heavens and the earth, right? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what does Abraham, what does Abraham say? Abraham replies, he doesn't, he doesn't fight with Melchizedek because he's not out to, he's not out to humiliate people. Mm-hmm. But what does he say in verse 22 when he responds? He says, and Abraham said to the king of Sodom, and he's speaking to Melchizedek as well, is what does Abraham say? Abraham says to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand, El Hashem, El Elyon, to the God of Israel, mm-hmm. El Elyon, the most high God, who's the creator of the heavens and the earth. So he actually corrects Melchizedek. He says, it's not your false gods that are, that are responsible for my victory. It's my God. Now, to me, that's so powerful because... There's so many times in life where where you've accomplished something, you know, hopefully it's something good, and someone's going to come up to you and just say, like, hey, you're amazing, right? What you did is incredible. And you have, you have an opportunity in that moment and the temptation in that moment to say, yeah, man, I am pretty amazing. Like, mm. I am amazing. Mm. Like, I'll just tell you, like, I've walked through the streets of Israel with Nate, and people come up to you all yeah, the time all the and time. tell you how, how awesome you are, right? People have an opportunity in that moment to say, 
yeah, I am pretty amazing. Like I'm incredible. I did this. Like, mm. I'm a hero. And what Abraham shows you is that in those moments, the the right thing to do is to give the glory to God. Yes. And say this the way I got here was because I'm devoted to something bigger. Mm -hmm. This is actually bigger than I am. Mm -hmm. That's the opportunity that Abraham has. Mm. And that's what he does to Melchizedek. In yeah. In big moments, uh, Abraham makes the right right decision. You know, uh, Psalm 110. I'm not sure if you if you if you want to look it up. Look it's, it up, baby. Yeah, it's a Psalm of David, and and it says Adonai declares. To my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Adonai will extend your mighty rod from Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will be uh, a free will offering in a day of your power, in holy splendor from dawn's womb. Yours is the dew of your youth. Adonai has sworn it and you, he will not change his mind. You are a Kohim forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. My Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations, heaping up corpses. He will crush heads over the entire land. He will drink from a stream along the way. So his head will be exalted. So what is David saying when he says that you are a, high, you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek? Man, it's such a, oh, it's such a good question. Mm. It really is such an unbelievable question. So... You know, how do you read that? How do you read that? This is how I, I read it, that, that Melchizedek was both a king and a priest, which is not the normal order of how the ultimate structure of Israel will be created, right? And so this is the first time that uh, we see the presentation of a priest, right? Prior mm -hmm. to this, there's no mention of a priest or anything, but all of a sudden we have this idea of a priest to the Most High mm -hmm. before God institutes his priesthood through the co uh, through the Levites, you know. Um, and so there's something in this small story that's significant because it's presenting both a priest and a king. And so David writes these words where he says that ultimately this idea that there's there's someone that God is preparing who's going to be um, in the order of Melchizedek, both a priest and a king, and he's the one who is going to crush the enemy's heads. And so even thinking about the fact that Abraham has come back from fighting kings, wicked kings, he's confronted by this priestly king of Salem, which is obviously mm -hmm. Jerusalem, where God will institute his kingdom. Um, it, it feels like this is like a prelude to or like a breadcrumb of what God is going to do later on. Kings, priests, the story of Israel... Um, which is all going to come from the line of Abraham. After Abraham gives glory to God, we find that he once again has a vision of God and God says, do not fear Abram, I am your shield, your very reward. Um, but Abraham said, my Lord, what will you give me since I am living without a child and my heir of the household is Eliezer from Damascus? Then Abraham said, look, you have given to me no seed, no house, um, no house born servant is my heir. Then God makes his next promise. This one will not be your heir, but in fact, you will come, uh, one will come from your own body who will be your heir. Uh, he took him outside and he said, look up into this, uh, look up now at the sky, count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall be your seed. One of the most powerful verses of Genesis comes next where, where it says, then he believed in Adonai and he uh, reckoned, him, uh, reckoned it to him as righteousness. This verse where God says, I'm going to consider you righteous, not because of anything you've done, but the fact that I can see you now believe my words. Your righteousness is going to be based on belief, which is interesting because I think up until this point, we would consider righteousness based on your acts or your works. But Abraham's righteousness is a credit to him purely based on an absolute belief that God is going to provide him with a promised son, a promise. You know, the, the, the interesting thing about Abraham mm is that if you actually go back to, uh, if you go back to um, like, where are we in chapter 11? Mm -hmm. 
So what you see is that when Terra, the end of chapter 11, right? Like beginning in, in verse 26, if you kind of read from there to the end of the chapter, you'll see that Terra has these three sons, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Mm -hmm. And uh, Haran, for, unclear what happens to him. He seems to have died young, but either Nahor, Abraham and Nahor are like the two, like they're like a pair, mm -hmm. right? Abraham's children will ultimately marry into Nahor's family. Yes. Rebecca's a descendant of Nahor. Nahor has, as it's described here, he has uh, he has wives and he has children. And if you look, you know, ultimately in the chapter after the binding of Isaac, um, it describes how many descendants Nahor had. He had tons of children. And what it highlights, like why, you know, it's a ten there's a tendency to think of these things as like boring genealogies, but they're not. You know why? Because what they highlight is what Abraham didn't have. Abraham had no children, no descendants. Mm. And here God is promising him, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. And mm. I'm going to, and I'm going to make your children as many as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. And I want you to actually, I don't want you to just know that I'm promising you that. I want you to act on that promise. I want you to leave everything behind because you believe that that's going to happen. Mm. And what the Bible's highlighting for us is that when Abraham makes that decision, not only did he not have any guarantee that those things would come true? It seemed physically impossible, right? Like he's old, doesn't have any children with Sarah. Sarah it seems to be infertile. And like the two of them together can't possibly fulfill this promise. Mm. And yet Abraham believes in God. Which, which I think is one of the most interesting things about how God chooses to tell his story. You know, we look at, Creation, chaos, Adam, failure, you know, Noah, failure. And then he goes, okay, well, I'm going to solve this with a 75-year-old man um, and an old woman who's barren, and I'm going to bring about a new line right. to, 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 to continue this story on. And everyone's like, why, why would you not choose a young 21-year-old fiery, you know, guy that's ready to take on the world. Why like are you a choosing? a hero out of Greek legend. Yeah, yeah, why are you choosing this older man who probably is looking at his life going, all right, well, I'm in the back end. Yeah. And God goes, because that's just the point. Yes. You expect me to do what you would do and I'm not you. You know, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And also when I do it, it challenges what you think is possible. If I take the 21-year-old guy and get him a young, you know, 20-year-old wife and they have children, okay. It's happened before. It's happened. Right? No one's gonna be <laughs> no one's gonna be shocked or impressed. Right. But when I take a 75-year-old man, tell him to leave everything he has, move him to a land he doesn't know, and then promise him a son, which he's gonna have to wait 25 years for, mm -hmm. um, then that becomes the story of God's glory in the unexpected circumstances of life and the the odds are against him it's like god likes to put the odds against him you know so often people go why did god choose the jewish people you know my opinion is he chose the people that would be the most challenging to him to bring about his <laughs> his whole story you know um the Torah and the Tanakh often says, and Moses himself says this, ah, they're a stubborn, <laughs> stiff-necked people. I don't know how that translates in Hebrew, but Moses is frustrated with them. I'm Kishay Oref. Yeah. yeah, and when he tells Ezekiel, he's like, I have to give you a head like iron because they're stubborn. So again, you go, okay, God chose these people because... But my, my grandfather used to have a joke. He was like a major theologian. He always used to say, Moses... Moses loved every single Israelite. He didn't like every single Israelite, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, it's like, and and even to this day, the story that God is telling through, uh, you know, the Jewish people are a minority in every circumstance, right? Like they're, let's say, if we're being generous, 15 million Jews in the world. If you're lucky. If we're lucky, day. you yeah. know, like God could have chosen, you know, another people mm -hmm. group that would, would be billions of people. But then again, you lose the story of what God's doing. You know, man looks for the big thing. God goes, I'm going to take the unexpected small thing and I'm going to make it big. Man goes, I want the shiny thing. Goes, I'm going to take the dull thing and I'm going to make it glow and shine. And so it's so often God 
showing humanity how little we know or how little we understand of what he's capable of doing and that's how his choice selection is. I'm going to do what you don't expect and when I do it and I do it well, you're going to be shocked but it's also hopefully going to bring you into place to know who I am and understand that I am the one to be glorified. Are there like are there moments are there moments in your life where you where you felt like greatness came from something I didn't expect? right or or it's it's the it's the worst moments in my life that drove me into the places where i'm meant to be you know the purpose i i look back at the moments where i was like this couldn't this is why are you doing to why am i going through this god why have you put me in this situation what could i possibly gain from this heartbreak tragedy disappointment and then years later you look at that as the moment of time where God shifted the story. I couldn't see it in the moment, but years later in hindsight you're like, "Oh, had it not been for that moment, I would have never been on this trajectory. And had it not been for that moment, I would have never chosen the path that I walked." And now looking at the path that I'm walking, I'm like, "This is where I was supposed to be all along. I can feel that and I understand that because there's no confusion in it, but I would have never got here myself." It was the moment of time where I was like, "I hate my life or I can't believe that this is happening to me. Where are you, God? Where God really was. And I think even with when we track through Abraham's story and Isaac, Jacob, and even the story of Israel, I think so often where we would claim God was missing, that's where God was the most. We just couldn't see it yet. And so even the idea of God making a promise, I'm going to give you a son, but Abraham's going to have to wait 25 years. So the realistic nature of him having a son gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Yet God already knew the time, the date, the hour when that was going to happen. The question was, were we going to trust him? You know what's amazing? So if you think about it, this story, like we're so used to this biblical story that we can kind of take for granted how weird it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about any great like mythological tradition, Mm -hmm. right? Like any great, you know, Greece, Rome, anything like that. What you have is like the hero's journey, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the the search for immortality, Mm -hmm. right? Hercules wants to become immortal. Achilles wants to become immortal. Ponce de Leon looking for the fountain of youth, right? Like King Arthur wants to become immortal. Every single great civilization has had the search for immortality. You know the only one that never had it? The Bible. Mm. Bible does not have a search for li- physically living forever. It just mm-hmm. doesn't happen. Because mm. you read this book and you see what God is saying to Abraham here, and it seems kind of like absurd. It's like, what does Abraham want? I, like, I'm at the end of my life. I'm dying. I'm decrepit. I'm mm. old. Like, I'm losing my touch. What does God say? I'm not going to help you. Mm. I will give you a kid though. Mm. Like what kind of, what kind of present is that? Like nowadays we take for granted, like, yeah, having kids is great. But like once upon a time, I mean, what you wanted is physical immortality. You Mm. wanted to get dipped in the river sticks and become invulnerable. Mm. Right. What the Bible realized is that search for physical immortality, living forever, like literally living for 5,000 years, it's never going to make you happy. Mm. And in fact, no civilization that ever searched for mortality ever found it. Literally, no one. The Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the early Britons, like no one ever found it. Mm. The Bible is the only tradition that doesn't have it, but the reason is because it actually found the secret to immortality. The secret to immortality is actually passing on this story to another generation. Whether it's your child, whether it's your niece, your nephew, your students, your neighbors, passing on that story to the next generation, that's immortality. Because you know what's amazing? You know, every year I think about this, like every year on Passover, I think about this, where on Passover, right, what God tells us in Exodus chapter, in Exodus chapter 12 and 13 Mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, one day, like Exodus chapter 13, one day your one day your child is going to ask you what happened in Egypt and you're going to tell him this is what happened and because of this God took us out of the land of Egypt. So every year on Passover, you know, in the Jewish community we kind of reenact that kind of we reenact that story. We tell that same story over again and we say um and what we do is we'll have a child actually ask a parent 
Like what happened once upon a time, just like the Bible says. And then the parent has to respond by telling the story. Mm -hmm. What I realized is I once realized this, like it was a few years ago with my, with my family. I was like every single generation going, you know, going all the way back to Egypt, thousands of years had that belief that though they were gone, the stories and the ideas would live on. Mm. That's real immortality. And actually like my great, 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 great grandparent going all the way back to Egypt actually had me in mind mm. and had that love for me. And I know that my community, you know, a hundred generations from now, like I actually think about them. Like I personally, Ari, I think about them and I, I want the best for them. And I have so much love for them. That's the secret to immortality. Like Hercules is gone. Mm. Achilles wasn't real, but this immortality, that's real. Mm. Telling that story to the next generation. And it lives on. Yeah. You know, I think one thing that we can also discover just from this part of Abraham's beginning story is how God interacts with Abraham, I think, is a really, really important building block for me to, to, to continue on my faith journey. When God first calls Abraham, Abraham, it's very generic. Yeah. Very generic. Right. Right. It's like, hey, I chosen you. Come on, get your stuff, go. I'm gonna take you to a right. I'm gonna take you to a land. Right. And I'm gonna give you a great name and, and yeah. people. That's it. Yeah. And based off very little information, Abraham obediently steps out in faith and, and follows that call. And 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 as Abraham tracks through life naturally with not a lot of direction, Abraham goes, okay, well, I'm with Lot and maybe I should separate from him because it doesn't <laughs> seem like it's a great idea. And now Lot's in trouble. Well, I'll go and save him. But as the story continues, God starts feeding and providing more insight and information into the direction where Abraham ultimately has to go, which is going to bring about what he desires most. Now, Abraham doesn't say at the beginning of the story, well, I'll tell you what, God, I'll go if you give me a son, you know, it doesn't come it's out like that. No, right. it's not. It's, 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 it's about going, I'm just going to trust you. And whatever you, your idea of good for me is surely better than what my idea of good for me. And as we track, God starts to reveal more of himself to Abraham. Why is that important? Because so many people want to start a faith journey, whether you're Jewish or Christian, and you just want to kind of get, give me the, 10 important things I need to know. Yep. <laughs> and then I'll just apply those things to my life and I'm good. Mm -hmm. And God's not looking for that type of believer. And God's not looking for that type of follower. What God is looking for is someone who is willing to walk a long, slow, arduous road that sometimes won't make sense. But by the end of it, you believe that his goodness trumps your ability to fail. And so... Abraham, I think, really presents the perfect example of that. Although it didn't always look like it was going to plan, and Abraham wasn't even perfect. Abraham would lie about his relationship with Sarah to protect himself. Yeah. And Abraham, in the next chapter, will trust Sarah in going, okay, let's just uh, make a baby. Right. Because <laughs> God made a promise, so we'll just do it the human way, which is what you can't. Yep. So here's the solution. So he'll go about man's way of solving God's problem. Right? Why is it God's problem? Because God made the promise. Yep. I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham says, okay, so I guess it means this. And so we see even moments of, of, of a lack of patience from Abraham, um, which again, another example in, in the second part of Abraham's story. You know, if you look at Israel right now, you have a battle of two tribes that claim to come from the same person, mm -hmm. Abraham. Ishmael and the Ishmaelites, which is where, you know, this Arab nation is claimed to be born and, and the birth of Islam. And you've got Judaism and the Jewish people from the line of Isaac. And this small, insignificant story to most is now playing out in a real world setting where people are saying, well, no, this is ours. And then I'm saying, well, this is what God promised us. And well, we, we come from Islam and we, well, we're from Judaism and we both strongly believe in the ideology of what our God promises and yet we're at lockheads. And that's all because Abraham said, all right, Sarah, let's, <laughs> let's, do let's it. go for it. <laughs> now, he didn't feel the repercussions of that. But now today in 2024, we're seeing 
how the snowball effect of sin has massive consequences for future generations. How does that make me think as Nathaniel? What is that, what is that, how does that apply to me now? Every single life choice I make does have an effect. It's either going to be positive or negative for future generations. And, and the question is, do I care? Do I care what happens to my future line? Like you say, this idea of forever. If I really, really, really care, I need to make sure that whatever happens in the next generation that I'm not involved in, I do something right now. Whether it's the choices I make in my life, whether it's whether I raise my children to fear and love the creator of the universe, whether it's how I choose my partner, all these things are ultimately going to dictate what happens to future generations, which I'm not going to see or I'm involved in. But as we can see in Abraham's story, they have massive consequences. So I have to be diligent and faithful in my choices and know that everything I do, whether it's going to directly affect me or not, is going to have an impact on someone. I'm like what Abraham does to that exact point, mm. Abraham has this amazing ability, and so does Sarah, they have this amazing ability to understand that they are not the last chapter. Mm -hmm. And no, and like, sometimes that's the most difficult thing in life is being in a season of tribulation, being in a time of, of challenge. And the temptation that we have is to say, okay, this is, this is just my world now. Like this is my life, but there is an opportunity during those times of darkness to recognize that this is not the final chapter that's been written. Mm. And so on the one hand, that's a comforting thought. But on the other hand, it actually imposes a responsibility on us, right? Because mm. imagine reading a book. Imagine you open a book. Like imagine you open the Bible. Imagine you open your Bible, I open my Bible, read these first couple chapters, skip all this part, and then read the end. And in between is nothing, mm. right? We're right now this in between part. Like we have a responsibility to write this chapter well so that the next generation can so the next generation can write their chapter. So in these in like whether you're thinking nationally, like what's happening in conflict areas right now, what's happening in Israel right now, whether you're talking about, you know, people who are under attack just because of, just because of, of a task that God has given them and they're hated for it, right? Mm. Or whether you think about just the person in their, in the course of their regular life journey, experiencing death of a family member, the loss of a loved one, the termination of a relationship, something mm -hmm. like that. In all of those times, it's so important. On the one hand, it's so comforting to say, you know what, this is not the last chapter. This is not my last chapter. Mm. And at the same time, you have to think to yourself, okay, what sentences can I write now to make sure that this chapter continues so we can reach the next chapter? Mm. And like, what are the sentences? Like, what are the, what are the things you can do right now? Like, I, I, I even, you know, like I even think for myself, I remember, um, um, you know, I remember, you know, early, like, or like being in college, for example. And, and I remember just like, you know, having that, having that feeling of like, not knowing at all what I wanted to do with my life, not knowing what career I wanted to have, not knowing where I wanted to go. And I would get, and listen, like I, I'm, I'm not like, I'm like a decently intelligent person, right? I remember thinking to myself, like every one of my friends, they know exactly what they want to do. Invest, you know, investment banker or chef or lawnmower or plumber or mm. doctor or lawyer, Indian G, whatever it is. Everyone kind of knew what they wanted to do. And I remember having this real feeling of just terrible, terrible uncertainty, just not knowing at all. And then I remember just having this epiphany and I think it actually was around the time, because yeah, it was it was like around the beginning of a school year. So it was around the time when we'd be reading this exact portion. Um, you know, like around like kind of September, October time. And I remember just having that thought of saying, listen, I don't know what the next chapter is gonna be. I just mm. don't. I don't know where I'm gonna be in my in my working life, in my career. I don't know if I'm gonna be stable in a year, two years, three years, five years but I know I can make some decisions now that will that will at least move this forward. You know, I can study extra hard for the exam that's coming up. I can, you know, I got married pretty early. Like Shalene and I got married, um, got married when we were 20. I couldn't even drink at my wedding. It was like not the legal drinking age, you know? Wow. But, but I just being, just take that time to be a good husband today, mm. right? 
those are sentences that you can write now so that you give yourself that space to write the rest of this chapter. And then, mm. and then you like, like Noah, like Abraham, you place your faith that God's going to help this book finish the way it needs to be finished. Mm. Like those are those moments, you know? Mm. And it's the, the only thing we can really, really control is how we respond yeah. to the circumstances around us. You know, the one thing I, I appreciate about, you know, this back end of this last part of this, you know, to, to get to chapter 18 before we start the next Pasha is how God doubles down, you know. Oh, yeah. He he chooses to rename Sarah and Abraham. And, and that's, a, I don't think when you read that first time, you really understand the implications of what God is doing. You know, he's taking ownership of Abraham's story. You know, when you name something, it's like you're, you you own it, right? Like it's like, uh, you know, the 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 owner of a, an object or, you know, when you have a child, it was your choice to name it, right? <laughs> it was your decision. Uh, they, the child didn't get much say in it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and so when God renames Abraham and Sarah, I think it's a powerful moment of him doubling down. And then he, he again, he confirms this like everlasting covenant that he has. Um, despite the fact that, yeah, Abraham didn't necessarily get the details of what God was saying uh, about a promised son, but he doubles down and 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 he, and he confirms to both Sarah and um and and Abraham himself that that they're going to have a son next year. Now Abraham's ninety nine years old when this happens, so right. you know understanding that God. God's timing is perfect. He, odds aren't great at this point. No, <laughs> odds aren't great. But God already knew the moment of time that this event was going to happen. And so I, I see so much grace in God allowing us the space to catch up to the story. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, God knows your story. He knows my story. He knows my first day. He knows my last day. And so often he gives me a level of grace that you see with his story with Abraham to catch up on the story. There will come a point where the test is going to come. There will be a test. Have I learned? Have I listened? God's not just happy for me to stay in the same state. I don't think God was uh, would, would have been happy if Abraham had have remained as he was from the beginning. There, there has to be a level of, you know, as Christians we call it like sanctification, mm. growth, growing into understanding of, of who I am in relation to God's story. And I see God is really doubling down with, with Abraham. And we see Abraham slowly following until we get to like the next chapter, which is, or the next you know, Pasha, which is going to be a, a big one. Oh, so the test. Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, what we have on tap, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read the Bible yet, but mm. like <laughs> what we got, what we have coming up is, first of all, the first child born into a world of covenant, right? Like you think about it as mm. like, I remember like people used to talk about digital natives and digital immigrants, right? Like, you know, generations that like grew up in a world without like social media, without smartphones, without whatever. Mm. And then you have to like figure out that technology versus a generation that's born into a world where all of this exists already. So Isaac is the first covenantal native. He's the first person born into a world where there's a covenant, mm. right? What are the that he didn't choose. That he did not choose. And by the mm. way, that's what, ultimately that's what covenantal relationships are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually don't have those kinds of agreement. Like that, a covenantal agreement doesn't exist anymore, right? Every existence, every, every, um, every type of agreement that we know of in our world is contractual, mm. right? It's you have something that I want. Mm -hmm. I have something that you want. We both agree to exchange it. We enter into this agreement freely, mm -hmm. and then then we part our separate ways, right? Mm -hmm. A contractual agreement takes two people who don't want to spend time together but need to in order to exchange something and gets them away from each other as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. right? What a covenant does is it takes two parties who often whom are on an equal footing, right? It's not like God and Abraham are equal partners, mm -hmm. right? And moreover, a covenant doesn't just bring people together who don't want to be together and separates them apart as quickly as possible. A covenant takes these two parties and brings them together forever. Mm. And all the future parties to the agreement actually don't get a say in it, right? Mm. They're bound by it. Mm. A covenant is about actually believing that this agreement is going to have meaning in the future, mm -hmm. not knowing that it will, but trusting that it will. Mm. So what we're going to have to look at next, and, you know, spoiler alert for the next episode, but what we're going to have to look at next is... 
what does Isaac do? Born into this world, he didn't choose, he didn't know, and now has to navigate. We're gonna have to talk about sacrifice. We're gonna have to talk about mm. what Abraham's called to do. And also, God, God's story is very, very clear. He knows the direction it's going, and it's not enough just to like make up the numbers, right? right? It's like we look at Abraham and Sarah, and they have they have their this child through um, Hagar, which is Ishmael. And it's not like God's like, ah, oh, yeah, that'll do. I'll, I'll work with that. <laughs> like, that's fine. God says, no, 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 no. This is my story. Yeah. This is my direction. It's not just like, uh, you know, first come, first serve, whatever whatever works is fine. It's There's a very, very specific purpose to everything I do. My, my story is in the details. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay attention to the details, which we saw Abraham sort of fail to do at yeah. the beginning, there's consequences and also you're going to miss out on what's really, really going on. And so, you know, Abraham is, a, is an incredible story because it's how God is now going to be intimate and have a really, really unique relationship with one man and shape him on his time and through the everyday circumstances of Abraham's life. God is going to start shaping him by the choices he makes. Mm. And I think that's so powerful because for the individual, it's like, yeah, God is in my story um, and, and God has a direction for my story. But when do I wake up to realize what that is? And how many wrong roads do I have to take before I start trusting God and seeing that, you know, I have something in common with Abraham. God has made a promise to me and I have to trust him based on his word. I can't see it can't feel it. And I don't know if it's going to pan out in my favor. I just have to trust him. Right. And so the father of faith, who is Abraham, we now can share him because now we have to make a choice. And, you know, Abraham's story ultimately comes down to having faith in a promised son. And that's where we end up landing going, okay, I got to trust the promise of God, whether I can see it or I can't, whether it's, it's something I can touch or feel, I have to trust him first because that's the only way moving forward with this relationship. Amen, brother. 